I'm Lou Copper, a member of the Point Blank team, and today I'm joined here in the studio by the head of school, JC. Hi. For this week's edition of Friday Forum Live. So for those that don't know, Friday Forum Live is your chance to see what we're about here at Point Blank, to ask your questions and uh, generally get involved really. Um, so yeah, make sure you get posting in the chat room. Um, anything you want to ask, whether it's about the school itself, what we do, or whether it's some more technical stuff, um, just get involved, feel free, and, and we'll try and jump on it as quick as we can. Um, we're also going to jump into a tutorial from JC. Uh, today we're going to be looking at um, some mixing techniques using the Waves plugins and UAD as well. Um, so yeah, any questions you have on that, feel free to ask and JC will be able to help you out. Um, but before we get into that, I was just going to run through a quick um, update of kind of what's been going on this week really. Um, so the first thing to talk about is the fact that all our online courses start on Monday. Um, so this Monday we've got everything from the individual four-week programs right the way up to the kind of combination programs. Um, so yeah, as I say, everything from the kind of four-week pro producer courses to these kind of um, bigger programs which are going to save you a fair bit of money. Everything starts on Monday and um, there are a few places left on, on most of the courses so make sure if you um, want to get enrolled you do so right away. Um, feel free to, to give us a call or email the course advisors. Just go onto the website and hit the, the contact us information. Um, also, what we've got to talk about is um, the brand new drum and bass course, um, which starts on Monday, the very first DMB course that we're running. Um, so, yeah, if you're into drum and bass, then make sure you, you check that out. That one is a pro producer course, so if you head here, you can find it just listed. It's a logic course. Um, and yeah, it's a brand new course, been developed by a few of the, the kind of key players in the drum and bass scene. Uh, Extra, Modified Motion, Zero T and Navigator. Um, so all those guys have had a, a kind of really big hand in, in developing this course. Um, definitely one to check out if you're a drum and bass fan. Even if you're into you know, your dubstep and stuff like that, then there's going to be a lot of transferable skills. Uh, so yeah, that's the drum and bass course. Also, um, the HE courses, um, our degree level courses, there are still a couple of places remaining. Uh, so if you are kind of keen to get that professional level, that degree level qualification, then, then make sure you check those out. Those ones are listed right at the top on the course page. Okay, and one more thing. Also, the uh, online DJ courses are still half price, half price until the end of September. So you've got about kind of three weeks or so left to book. Um, so yeah, if you want to learn DJing from home, make sure you jump on those. That is the, the, the DJ Serato course, also the Ableton Live Performance course as well. Um, both of those half price, as I say, till September. Um, also, to talk about, um, for the first time, we are going to be over in Ibiza uh, later this month, delivering a whole day of free DJ workshops. Um, so if you are watching from Ibiza or if you're going to be in Ibiza, then um, make sure you check that out. We're going to be at SV Hotel on Thursday the 27th of September from about midday and we'll be running free workshops to, to learn to DJ um, on kind of industry standard pioneer equipment all day. Um, so yeah, there's some more information on the blog on that one. Um, if you go to pointblankonline.net forward slash blog, and you can see in the latest section, we've got all the details about the free um, Ibiza workshops. Um, and finally, one more thing to talk about on our YouTube channel. We've recently archived um, an amazing session with um, Rafferty, Point Blank Tutor Rafferty and the vocalist Robert Owens. Um, we welcome Robert Owens down to the school to, to do a kind of vocal recording session. Um, it's a really, really good session. Um, you can see kind of two producers um, or two artists at, at the kind of top of their game kind of working together and, and kind of freestyling out really on a beat. Um, so yeah, definitely, definitely worth checking out. Um, apart from that, um, that's kind of it for, for this week. Um, if you are, are locked into the channel, then give us a shout. Um, as I say, we'll, we'll, we'll try and shout you all out. I can already see we've got um, someone locked in from, from Cape Town. Um, and a few other guys in there. So yeah, get posting your questions. Um, and for now, I'll hand you over to JC and we'll, we'll look at some mixing techniques. 
Cool, nice one, Luke. No worries. So hi, guys. Um, yeah, so we've looked at drum te re mixing techniques already in the past uh, last session we've done together. But at that stage, we were using Logic plugin as a lot of our courses you use literally the Logic plugins because it's easier to share project across, mm -hmm. you know, with the tutors, but also every student. Uh, I know everybody likes their third party plugin. They all have their favorite. Uh, but because not everybody has the, have the same, it becomes difficult. So that, that's the reason why we always insist on using the plugins bundled with the packages mm -hmm. on our courses. We get a lot of those questions online. Uh, but the techniques are the same, you apply them. Except that the interface works a bit differently, each interface of plugin. And that's kind of what I wanted to, to show today a little bit. Some of the most used plugins that we used to use in the hardware world that have now been translated, a oh, while back anyway, um, on the on the plugins scene, you know, with uh, Waves and UAD, which I believe you know are some of the best uh, plugins out there for mixing, emulating classic hardwares. So, gonna take you some of the stuff, and I'm gonna start with the kind of SSL channel, which uh, looks like that, and pretty much looks like a real SSL channel uh, that you have yet you found on many desks. Uh, the SSL was the desk of choice, you know, for many. Produce, mixer producers from the 80s until still is, you know, now. Um, especially in hip hop, R&B, dance music, those desks are, you know, mixing engineer, big mixing engineer specifically ask for that series, the E-series, which is the one that people like Max Stein, for example, uses as his own desk in his studio. So that's the classic one, and it basically comes bundled with an EQ, compressor and a gate, all in one, all in one, and that's why it made, you know, it became really famous because you could really access all the stuff on, onto one channel. So let's have a listen here. We've got this tune and I'm gonna first maybe bypass what I've done. I, I've, I haven't done much on this mix, you know, very little basic stuff, but to illustrate some of the techniques again used by mixing engineers using those kind of hardware. So first let's have a listen. So that's the kind of flat version with no plugins at all. I've just balanced it very quickly. So now let's, la let's look at what I've done on the kick, for example. So I'm bringing up, I've used the SSL on the kick, but again, you could try different, you know. The key with, at the moment, what I'm trying to show you guys is to start, if you've got different plugins, put them on, compare them. You know, it's not like when you're in a real recording studio, you don't have really that luxury, you just have to get on, you know, you're working against the clock. Uh, but at home, you've got the luxury, try a lot of different plugins, see what works better. So here I'm trying first, trying that and I'm gonna get rid of the compression for now and show you a bit of the EQ. So here you've got the filters and you see the first thing that maybe is gonna strike you is that you don't have a visual representation. There's no waveform all of a mm -hmm. sudden. You're going away from the, you know, and I think it's good when you're becoming a bit more confident to start using those kind of stuff. You don't look, you listen. Yeah, yeah You know, yeah. you use your ear, you forget about the spectrum analyzer, etc., etc. Use your ears. So here, for example, the low, so you've got the kind of shelf that can become a bell for low frequency, low mid, high mid, top end, and your kind of low cut and high cut. So I've put a bit of a low cut here at about 20, not much higher than that, just to clean the bottom end. I've cleaned a little bit the top end just at 18, but really doesn't do much to it. It was just, just a little bit to, to get the, this kind of very kind of sparkly click out. But uh, what I've done here, the, fit, the, the big thing for me about this kick is if you bypass here, there's this kind of boxiness, uh, quite boxy at around muddiness, at around 200 hertz, if you boost it. And the way to analyze frequency, you don't view them, but you yeah. get used to train your ears and pinpointing you know, the one that you like. And the, the best techniques usually is by literally you boost and start going through the spectrum and finding out what is the frequency that is the most offending, if you like. So all that is cool here. You know, you've got the click and stuff, but it's not really the offending stuff. You're getting into the ter territory here, as you can hear. This kind of harmonics, boxing X. So for me, there's this frequency here and potentially around here as well, that is a bit. But that's the one where I think you get a bit of muddiness and because after that you want to fit the, the bass and stuff, I would curve it here a little bit. And straight away you hear the difference. 
here it is, it's a bit more curved, a bit more room. And to compensate that, what I'm doing is I'm boosting a little bit here at about 60 hertz. So you can have a listen here, bringing a bit of warmth to it. If you're going in the red here, you've got your channel here, output, we can turn it down to compensate. So at the moment I'm going to go there, roughly here, here you are. So now that's my EQ. And now you've got a bit of compressor here. Again, different, different interface for the compression here. You literally have two attack modes, a fast attack and a, uh, and a smaller attack. If I put a fast attack here, what is going to happen is that you're going to see your gain reduction here. I'm bringing up the ratio here. I'm bringing up the threshold here, but you see here, not too much reduction is completely squashing it. You're losing completely the front end, and I don't think it works at that type of track. So I'm going to use a fast attack, a slow attack, sorry. You d hear the difference on the transient, what it does. Completely different mm -hmm. flavor. So I want a bit of a, it, with a slow attack, what it does is actually bring a bit of the transient through, and you're actually getting more whack on the front of the sound. So that's the difference what we have now. Do, you have, do we have any question now at the moment? We do, actually. Um, we've got a quick question um, from Manufiction who's asked, what's the best, what's the best to set l your logic meters, linear or exponential, and what's the difference between the two? Ah, in terms of the this meter, do you mean this meter here? I take it. I guess so, yeah. Uh, exponential is the, is the way to go. Uh, linear is literally, think of it as a curve going straight up. This is not how our ears are working, and this is okay. not how fader are working. So you get more of a curve. Exponential is going to be something more like that, looking as a curve more like that. And this is how we hear things. So when you push your fader, I don't know if you've noticed, guys, for example, if you play with your fader in iTunes, have you noticed that it's the way it's pushing up is by increment, it's incrementing, mm -hmm. and you don't have like a smooth ride? Yeah. So exponential is, is the okay. way our ears is working, so I, I, would, I would use that. I did not, to be honest, completely honest, I did not even know you could set your meters in those you modes. Can it, yeah, you yeah. could change it, but I, I, I would, you know, this is the way we listen to, we hear stuff. But I guess logic is set up with exponential. I already. would imagine yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, at the moment, I mean, just, just to run through a quick um, group of shouts, re really, we've got people locked in from Serbia, from uh, the beautiful Croydon, from Amsterdam, hey. Portugal. Um, Cape Town, yeah, lots of people locked in. Um, so yeah, keep your questions coming uh, again, whether it's about mixing or whether it's more general point blank stuff. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll get back into it. Cool. Cool. So uh, yeah, let's go back to that. So I'm going to go on to the clap now. And again, I'm going to carry on with the SSL a little bit to show you another feature that it has, which is pretty neat. Um, so let's have to listen to the clap. At the moment, if you need some visual representation, I mean, what you could do is basically bring the logic EQ after the SSL, put the analyzer on, bypass mm. every part of the EQ, so you still have a visual representation. You know, that's a good way maybe to train your ears a little bit more and see how each EQ works out. And actually, by moving the EQ here, you'll see how it reacts in the graphics. So it may be a good way for you guys to... So you're just to using EQ as a spectrum analyzer? Yeah, effectively. Yeah. 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 So if you have a spectrum analyzer, let's say, like mm -hmm. the Wave one, the PAS, use that instead, mm -hmm. you know, whatever you're, you're used to. I have to say I quite like the spectral analyzer on the logic one. Yeah, me too, actually. I get used to, you know, you get used to it. It's about what you're getting used to. And then you hear relates to what you see, if you like. Uh, and then eventually you, what you're aiming at is not viewing anymore, but only listening. Mm -hmm. So let's have it. So you see here on the very low frequency, especially here, so it, it may be that it's coming from it's been maybe the sound has been generated maybe through analog synthesis or maybe it's been sampled from a vinyl or whatever it is but there's a lot of low energy here and because it plays with a kick it's kind of again uh, messing up with the bottom end you know we want to clip the key especially with that kind of electro 
house, I think you really want the click, the, the key to be really, really mm. clean. So we've got a quick one, JC. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. No, um, no. Just a quick one. Um, the influencers asked if you put the SSL straight on the track or whether you would put it on the master, but it looks like you've got it straight on the kick track. I've got it on the track. There's going to be a. Con I mean, for me, I'm going to go through that. Mm -hmm. It's you know when you mix, and I think pretty much every mix engineer, you tend to put, to have them on the individual track. You treat your sounds individually, then you may group them, buzz them, treat the bus, and then have a compressor over the whole mix again. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not unusual. The, the, the key being, instead of whacking too much into the co one compressor, you tend to do a little bit at several stages. You tend to have a slightly better result mm -hmm. with that. Uh, also, one of the reasons I've kept SSL on the, across, it's part of that. I think one of the big key about uh, mixing it on a board is the whole summing ID. The fact that you're using the same devices and they're all going through. So by using same plugins, I think it's more coherent mm -hmm. sound wise. Yeah. Even if the sound don't have the camera, you know, the same kind of sound that analog gear have. But I think it makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll look into that quickly. So so here I'm using the uh, quite a high filter at about 160, 70 to get rid of the low end. And you see straight away. You could go higher, but for me it sounds a bit thin now starting to sound a little bit thin, so I'm going to keep it here. Uh, if anything, it sounds a little bit brittle. Brit so what I've done on the EQ was, let me bypass that. You see here, around 2K, just a little bit. I'm not a big fan of that. So I attenuated that a little bit, and I wanted to bring a bit of bite in the mid. Just a bit of body, and that I feel works better. Again. I'm going to show you more about that later, guys. Uh, compression, same, slow attack to get a bit of snap at the front. Relatively short release. And I'm compressing it a little bit more here to keep that kind of regular. So that works great for me. There's a couple of things that I loved about the SSL. In the days, you know, it had this gate expander, which when we used to mix from tape, you would get a bit of hiss. Inevitably, you know, like a tape cassette, that's mm -hmm. part of analog, you know, you get a bit of hiss. Occasionally it wouldn't be a problem, sometimes it would. So what you would do is every channel would have a little gate here. So that's your threshold and that's your range. I'm going to start with the full range, that means when the door is closed, it's effectively, it's completely closed. So you see. Now, the beauty of it, I'm going to make it really quite severe, is that by using that, you notice that on the sample, there's a bit of decay, quite a long decay, some sort of reverb, part mm -hmm. of the clap. Yeah, yeah. If you wanted to tighten it up, what we, you can do is use actually that. And you see straight away, it's much tighter. You've cut off. You've, you've cut off. So it's a, nice, it's a nice little feature to have. If you want it even more radically, at the moment I've got it as an expander, you can have it as a gate. So you see, really tight now. But I'm going to have it just a tad. Another feature on the channel is this analog feature, on and off. What it is, it's on a lot of those emulations, especially on the Waves collection, all have this feature of analog. It's, it adds a little bit of a, a bit of noise, basically, to, to emulate analog. So if I close now that, let's have a listen to our kick. And it's really tight now. One of the key about the SSL, I think that I really liked personally as a mix engineer was that it really has that kind of really tight sound and straight away now if you compare with and without yeah it's little it's quite little but actually it makes a massive difference yeah, in terms definitely. of you know it's already a lot tighter any questions so far guys um, it looks like, yes, we have. Um, we've got a question about um, any plugins that are CPU friendly. Um, someone's asked if, if you've ever tried the Air Windows plugs, Air Windows plugins? No, no, no okay. never, never use those. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, again, the key about, see, you know, have you, you may have noticed here, talking about CPU guys, everything was put in audio, yeah. which means I don't have one single soft synth. That means you're making the most of the CPU for your plugins. Mm -hmm. I think there's two reasons. I mean, I, th I think we discussed that already in the past, but it's about you committing as well. The fact that everything yeah, is in yeah, audio, yeah, yeah. it's committed, the timing is not going to move, it's solid, 
And on top of it, you're making the most of your CPU. I have also um, put the buffer size to the maximum, so that means I can make the most. Exactly. The problem with the buffer size, the, the bigger the buffer size, is when you tweak a parameter on a plugin, it's going to take, it, there's a latency before it takes FX. That's the only little annoying thing I find with um, mm -hmm. higher buffer size. More CPU, but you don't get the instant. So you have to be quite slow when you're tweaking a plugin to here. You know, it's the same idea as latency that when you play, basically, that's why. Um, okay, cool. We've got um, a couple of other questions. Um, one about processing drum samples. Do you spend a long time processing the samples before you import them to get them sounding as good as possible before sequencing? It's uh, personal, I guess. Yeah, it's, it? yeah and, and, and I suppose it depends if you create your own samples. Mm. I mean, the reality is, like most of the day now, the, the sound library are so big and so. And, and quite good. And, as we, well. and actually much better than yeah. they've ever been. Yeah, so yeah. I find that I tweak them a little bit. You mm. know, you might tweak the envelope if you want it more or shorter. You might tweak a little bit the filter, the tuning, more importantly, I think. Mm -hmm. But overall, there's not much to do. You know, I tend to keep it at the mix if it's gels really well. If it doesn't work, yes, I look into it. And it, if it doesn't work, I mean, I, I go for another sound. I would go for another sound rather than... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, another one from um, RAD Prod who's asked, um, should he cut 30 to 40 hertz on the master? <laughs> uh, I know there's this thing about, I've seen a lot of dance producers who systematically put 30 hertz. I mean, 50 for me is way too high yeah you know yeah, i like i like my sub uh the warmth is there i'm not even talking sub here sub is 30 40 mm. you know 50 starting to be base yeah, you know, yeah, base yeah 60 yeah. so only do it if it if you need to yeah i mean only do it if you need to you know that's something for me that i've noticed from mixes made in the 90s and mixes made now 20 years later i think the mixes in the 90s are not as loud but they have much more bass. Mm. They're warmer somehow. And it's because we're cutting systematically now at 30. Leave it at the mastering stage. You know, the mastering engineer will make well, the what decision. What would be the benefit? Why would Because for me, I think... It's only this rumble. love bass. Yeah, you know? no, no, no. It's because if there is too much information in this, in this area. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what I was showing here. You know, if, for example... Uh, I guess it's again, if you want a very clean... You see here, I've, done the, I've done... Yeah, exactly. Here, if you look here... I've cleaned it. If you look here, I've cleaned it. Mm -hmm. So there's no point, there's nothing to clean anymore. Uh, and if everything is cleaned and quite well mixed, then yeah. you'll probably don't need, you know. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, we've got another one. Um, should we put the master um, minus 6 dB or or some sort of limiter the whilst master making failure. the track? Mm, oh, it's really up to you. I mean, as you know, guys, I mean, here you can see I'm clipping a little bit, but not L too much. Logic's fairly good with it, though, isn't it? Yeah, well, not on the master. Not on the master, yeah. On the individual fa fader, because it's 32-bit internal, and people, for you of you guys who, who work 64-bit, you've got a headroom which is just, you, you know, you, you'd never distort it, basically, mm -hmm. internally, on, on, on a single channel. On the master fader, fader, as soon as you go in the red, it's clipping, it's distortion. Personally, I like to work, again, it's coming from me being an old school guy, so uh, I tend to keep my fader at zero and mm -hmm. I adjust all my mix to fit within that. Uh, I, feel, I feel safer that way, yeah. but it, it's me. Okay, um, and another one um, from the influencers asked, when you were using the SSL, was there like a logical, um, like a logical kind of path in terms of which knobs to turn, or are you just kind of going as you go? Like? You guys, I mean, the same way, I mean, well, I love that yes, I said it's all in one channel, so you've got your EQ, your compressor, and it has that sound. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of the things I personally like about it. Uh, I guess you're just listening and tweaking, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, I mean, if you're going to set up, if you had in mind that uh, I need to compress, start with the compression mm -hmm. and see what it brings. If you feel that it needs to be corrected and do a bit of EQ first, do, a bit, do your EQ first and then move on so you know same same okay. cool um a couple of other questions michael hull has asked um what do you think of the jjp plugins uh on the waves yeah I've, i mean all those series that have been made by the the chris lord and kramer and all those big guys you know really really big mix engineers um what what they are is effectively like I've used a little bit the Chris Lord, I think, on the vocals. And what it is, is you've got a delay, a reverb, uh, pitch shifting, basically all the effects that 
typically you would put in a mix all in one. And instead of having to go through the whole setting, which is lengthy, you just push literally one fader and it gives you your delay. One fader is your reverb, one is your pitch shifting, mm -hmm. uh, you know, one is maybe a bit of distortion, a bit of growl, uh, a bit of attack, a bit of de -essing. So it's, a, it's basically a one fader. It's like a one button doing everything. So <coughs> they are practical, they're handy, but personally I like to do my whole set, mm -hmm. you know, my whole settings. But yeah, use them by any means, you yeah. know, they're, they're actually quite good. Cool. Yeah, really. um, and just before we get back into the tutorial, I've got to give a big shout out to Brian Sexton, currently sitting in work watching the, the broadcast, trying not to get caught by his manager. So yeah, we hope you're all right, Brian, and uh, stay locked in. <laughs> uh, right, let's get back into it. Over to JC. Cool, cool, guys. So we've looked at the, the SSL. What I've done after that, we've got all our, all our hi-hats. Somebody has talked about uh, CPU friendly. Yes, absolutely. It's the same as in the real world, you know. In the big studio, you wouldn't have 50 amazing compressors just partly because they probably can't afford it. Yeah. Um, so and it's nice to have a, a diversity of it as well. Uh, and it's the same here, you know, the, the, the best compressors, maybe the most processing intensive plugins, you can't have them in every channel because otherwise you're running out of DSP. Um, so the key when you're mixing drums and everything else is to keep your best Comp your best devices for the most important part of the elements of yeah, the track yeah, yeah. and maybe use not as CPU intensive plugins. So for my hi-hats here, for example, I've used the Logic. I've used the Logic. So let's listen to that one quickly, what I've got here. So again, this one, there was a bit of a... Uh, for me, I, I did find it was a bit dull. It didn't really come across in the mix. So if I put my kick and clap, a bit dull so uh, I basically brought an up here around 5k and here there was a bit of a peak here which was again a bit annoying for me a bit mm -hmm. muddy so now it fits nicer a bit more exciting and then you've got another hat here which is the open hat <laughs> the key was for me they really work together so I wanted to make them sound like they were working together yeah. So about balancing it, making it sound EQ wise. They were quite different actually. So if you look at what I've done here on that one, let's have a look. Yeah, there was a massive here. If you hear it when it's gonna come. Yeah. Quite pokey and uh, quite muddy again in that area at around 400. So I wanted to bring it in line with the other hat. Now it really works well together. Another big sound comes in is that one probably need to listen to you on its own guys this one typical example we've asked about it so I'm gonna remove it's a lot of bottom end yeah. yeah check the bottom end this is a white noise that has been made mm -hmm. probably with a synth I would imagine so check the bottom end that is really gonna create a big mess in your mix you know if you start doing that it's always when you want it that's not you see the space it's taking, the bottom end, mm -hmm. it's straight away, it's taking over the kick. Uh, and because it's so cross here, literally from 500, you know, to 20 to 500 hertz, it's going to go over the synth, the bass, it's, you don't need it there. So I've made a massive cut on that one, quite a big one, up to 760. Also, for me, it's a white noise. Check out what's going on at the top end here. Loads going on at, about, at 20k, mm -hmm. you know, almost peaking at 20k. Far too much here. That's going to create probably problem. I'm not going to go into that technical side of things today. Um, later on, few, in few weeks time, I'd like to do a mastering one and we'll go into that. But that's probably going to create some anti-aliasing problem and all that kind of stuff. So, and also, it goes against the, the rest of the hi-hats, in my opinion. You see? The other hi-hat doesn't have space. So, I've put... That sounds a lot better a cut here on the top end, so suddenly it's isolated, it's contained, and the hat, the other high hat, really come through. So it's about finding each of them their own space. And the same here with that one, which is the percussion hat. I need to mute stuff a little bit to show you guys. You see this one? Very similar. And I needed to find a space for it. So what I've done is I've panned it for a start. And I'm going to do this quite a big 
boost here at around 1, 2, 1K. But you see here now, you really hear it does something. Otherwise, it's just doubling up and not really doing anything. And now uh, there's a groove going on. It puts an accent. And, uh, and let's check it out now, <laughs> together. So here you are. Any questions more? Uh, yeah, we have actually got a couple. Uh, cool. First one, uh, the influencers asked, um, what's the name of the track? Um, it's, by the, it's by Rock Element, who's one of a, a tutor at Pont Blanc. He's helped us designing the electro course. It's called Twilight. Uh, yeah, I think that's out as well, isn't it? I think one? it's out, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, we've got another one. Um, someone's asked, um, any advice on tap sa tape saturation plugins to add a bit of warmth or distortion distortions to the overall mix? Yeah, 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 that can, that can work pretty well. Uh, UAD have some really nice one, that's the, that's the ID. Uh, basically, instead of being tape saturation, they are literally mm -hmm. an emulation of tape machine. Wave has one as well, done by Kramer. Um, I've heard of uh, PSP Vintage Warmer. Yeah, quite PSP, a few guys yeah, yeah, yeah P PSP Vintage Warmer, really nice. Mm -hmm. Again, be gentle with it, it's something you would probably use more as a parallel, mm -hmm. rather than inserting it straight away, you could you know, send it as a parallel and bring it slightly with the mix, mm -hmm. and then those how much you want, and what you want to send into as well. If you use it with a bus, then you can select whatever what you send into it. Um, okay, cool. We've got um, another one um, from Darren, um, who's asked, um, about mixing the kick and the bass. To be honest, I think that was something we covered two we covered, weeks yeah, ago. Yeah. So if you go to the YouTube channel, um, youtube.com forward slash point blank online, you should be able to check out one of the, the previous Friday Forum Lives where we go into it really in depth. So definitely check that out after this yeah. and you'll get a really good guide to mixing the kick and the sub. Um, also, we've got something about tuning actually um, from Funkmaster Buzz who's asked um, if, if a the song is in a certain key, how do you go about tuning um, a kick? Or, it, it, or it depends if there's a lot of resonance and a, a, and a clear kind of uh, pitch that you can hear on the kick. Mm -hmm. You know, typically a low 808 and stuff like that, you're going to have that kind of boom, like a note, you know, that you can perceive. So then, yes, you would try to match it to the bass notes where it's playing with, to the key of the song, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, with snare, it can be a third, it can be a fifth, sometimes it doesn't matter. You've got to play with it a little bit. You've got to play with it. But yes, tuning drums can be a really big element, especially percussion, I find, yeah. in dance, on dance music. You mm -hmm. know, electronic percussions can really... Uh, it's, if it all works in the same key, it's, it, it, it makes, makes it stand out. Yeah, absolutely, it? Yeah. completely. It's, com it's more coherent. Mm. Um, okay, we've got another one from RAD Prod who's asked, does it matter if the um, EQ is before or after the compressor? Depends. I yeah. think we've went into it a couple of times, done, yeah. every time we go, we go into it. Um, with compression first, and I, I can show you here maybe, for example, with compression first, like on this sub-layer, for example, we've talked about bass, we had a question about bass, mm -hmm. uh, so I'm gonna, we, we've got a sub-bass here. Sounds great, on its own. The thing with sub-bass, and, and, and the reason you know we've talked about why do you cut 30 sometimes on the on big club, is that on, at, at that level, the 30 hertz and stuff, it's really boomy, it's gonna have so much energy. Mm. That's what's gonna move your driver, you know, your big speakers. Um, compressing it is really gonna keep it there. That means you can have it there, but it's still really, really under control. So that's one of the big things. So on this sound here, for me, I didn't feel there was much to do in terms of EQ because the sound is there. Sub, yeah. So the first thing I've done was putting a, a compressor, which allows me to move on to another set of plugins, which are from the UAD. Mm -hmm. I mean, th those plugins, this URI, for example, is also available as the, I think it's the CLA, Chris Lord, um, on Waves. But I really like what UFD have done, Universal Audio, uh, reissue of the classic 1176 here. It's a compressor that a lot of people are using in the studio, one of the most used ever, I think. Mm -hmm. You see, you still see them in a lot of studios. Used a lot on vocal, guitar, and bass. You know, typically okay. on bass, it's massive. So have a look here. So what I've done here, this compressor, completely different than your typical compressor. No threshold, there's a ratio 4, 8, 12, or 20, no okay. in between. Uh, attack, release, but there's no threshold, no makeup gain. 
it's based on how much you send into it. So the more you send into it, the more I'm compressing. Yeah, yeah. And you see here my reduction. What I find with those compressors, what I love is that you really can start compressing quite a, a lot out of it. You know, I don't think with a logic compressor you could, you could do that, to do that, that, kind, much, of, that yeah. kind of amount of, comp of compression. Here you really can really go for it. It still sounds good as well. Yeah, you know what I mean? That's why it's used a lot on bass. It doesn't completely get rid of, the, you know, cheap compressors, what happens, the more bassy sound you sound into them, they tend to start making them sound a lot thinner. Mm -hmm. This one really keeps the whole bottom end, but it's becoming, so I'm not gonna do as much, but a bit like that. So I think we can go with that, you know, seven dB of that reduction easy. And then the key, once you're happy with how much you're sending into it, the key is to line up the output, which is to make it back to the same level that it's without before the compression. So I think we're pretty much good. Two things about the attack and the release is that you would imagine that in that position, completely on the left, would be fast attack. For some reason on the U it's the opposite. <laughs> so if you want a really fast attack, you have to go full on. It's just something you need to be aware of. Are you noticing what happened on the sub bass? With a really fast attack, it's distorting. Mm -hmm. It's something that is deaf, it's across most compressors. Too fast attack on the bass line, you're starting distorting. So here, much slower attack. Sounds much better, doesn't it? You know, and you can see here, fast attack, it's coming, slow, it's not coming back. Mm -hmm. Slow release. So I think here, a kind of 10 past 10 setup, this kind of works pretty well. So now, the only thing I've done with the bass, with the sub, is that with those kind of sub bass, when you change notes, you're gonna have some notes that are gonna be louder. And have you noticed that when it goes up, it become a bit louder? So all I've done is I've used the Logic EQ, and the high notes, I've highlighted the frequency, I've found which frequency mm -hmm. it was, and I've literally turned it down, not because the frequency was annoying, but because I wanted to level up the notes. So the low notes to the high notes, now they've got the same level. And that's pretty much that on my sub bass. Check it out. Now, one of the reasons I haven't gone more mental and I'm not putting more bass on my kick, is because I want to leave space for yeah, that yeah, bass. Yeah, yeah. So it, I think it answers a little bit that question about yeah, bass kick and bass, kick yeah. again. You know, it's a clicky, it's not a thin kick, but it's not extremely fat. It's because I wanted to have quite a lot of my sub here. The kick does work well. I think, it works really it? well, you know. And the difference we're, with that bass is that we're getting another bass sound. It's that one. Another favorite of mine is this pull take EQ. A lot of people ask me, oh, how is it working? Uh, you've got basically those three buttons, the boost, attenuate, and CPS here, they work together. You can either boost or attenuate and you choose which frequency here. Again, it's not a fat bass sound. We've got a sub taking care of that. Mm -hmm. So what I've done is I've boosted a little bit, 100. It warms it up a little bit, check it out without. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think that's what I love about the UAD and, and some of the wave plugin that they've done really well is that this device, this really nice EQ, Sometimes you would use it even in bypass mode without even doing anything. As soon as you put the sound through it, it becomes a bit larger, a bit bigger. Um, and the boosting here is always really nice. And I've also boost, boosted a little bit of this. Uh, these three buttons here, these three parameters, boost, frequency and bandwidth work together. You can't attenuate, it just boosts any of these frequency from 3K to 16. And this attenuate button only works for those. So it's like a high pass filter basically, mm -hmm. where you can attenuate 20k, 10 or 5k. Here I've boosted quite a fair bit of 8k and 100 hertz. And I think it works really well. This time round, I've EQ'd first and I'm compressing afterwards. What I wanted to do is that because I've boosted those frequency, getting quite a bit of click, I wanted to keep them under control. So I'm sending into the URI again. 
So you see, notice the difference now. Mm-hmm. It's a lot tighter. I think it works really well now. Yeah, definitely. Do we have any more questions? Um, da, 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 da. We have. Um, Oh, Dilip Patel's asked, when is the next masterclass? Um, I think that one's in about two weeks. I think it's September 23rd, 25th. Um, that one's with FOMO, who's a resident for Chew the Fat and, and um, Space in Ibiza. Um, and then after that, we've got a few in October. I think one we've got with um, the drum and bass DJ Hatcher. Um, and uh, yeah, a couple of others after that. Um, but yeah, again, if you just head to the blog, you should be able to find all the information on upcoming masterclasses. Um, what else have we got here? Um, um, it seems to be a lot of conversation answering each other's questions, which is always good. Okay. Um, I think someone's asked about the UAD plugins, which we've actually had a look at. Um, yeah, I mean, I've got to say per- personally, but it's only a personal test. I'm not, I'm not here to support mm-hmm. uh, brand any yeah, <laughs> any yeah, company. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I have to say, the UAD for me is is, is uh, uh, there's something about what they're doing that really mm-hmm. appeals to me. Partly because it's emulating all the stuff that I've used for 15 years in studio, so I'm finding it natural to come back onto them and the sound of them. Um, someone um, overthrows asked, um, is there a particular sequence um, that you go through when, when setting up the parameters of a compressor? So for example, oh, I've lost the question. So for example... Um, Threshold or ratio. Yeah, or yeah exactly. Yeah, 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 no, good yeah. question. Uh, as you've seen here, obviously with the Yuri, those kind of old school devices, um, it's slightly different because all of a sudden, you, you know, you set a ratio of four or eight, you select your ratio first and then you judge how much you're going. Normally, I would, let's say, I would start with a ratio of four or six, quite high, and then I would use my threshold and set it up where I feel that's where I want it to be triggered. And then I would start adjusting my ratio accordingly until I'm getting the right amount of reduction. And then I would go on to the attack and release to fine tune it. Mm-hmm. Okay. That would be the kind of sequence. Okay. Um, apart from that, um, we've got um, someone who's asked um, if they don't have UAD, um, have you got any other recommendations? Yeah, oh, there's loads. Yeah, yeah. It really has loads. I, I mean, mean Waves, for example, yeah. they're doing a lot of great stuff. You know, you don't have to get the, the full Monty. You can buy bits and pieces. They do that uh, uh, offer every discount every month. Um, there's one, because I'm a big fan as well, there's one plugin that I wanted to show you guys that I haven't put here. I mean, there are these old school ones like Fairchild. I mean, this is, used, is a, we're talking 30 grand to buy one of those nowadays. <laughs> there are very few of them, le- you know, left in the world. Uh, they've got about 20 to 40 valve in there, I think. Mm. Either 20 or 40, I never remember quite. Uh, they're from the 50s and they're, again, they, they sound really awesome. Here I've put it, for example, on the, um, on the master bus. And again, sending a little bit here. The more you send, the more it's going to compress, you know. And here you've got a threshold as well. So you see, completely different parameters. And then you've got attack, fixed attack. And that's pretty much that. There's nothing else you can do with that, mm-hmm. you know. But those were used from the 50s. It's still one of the best. It's known as the Rolls Royce. Of mm. compressors and that for example this one you can have in waves you can have this is the UAD version you also ha- can have it with a T-Rex actually which I believe we have as well on this computer um, if I find it if I can it's not flux uh, I thought we had the T-Rex on this computer but uh, yeah I came multimedia and it's there so the VC 767 for example, another version of it. So those t racks do some really good stuff lately. Uh, another compressor that I really, really like is the SSL uh, Quad Comp, which was basically, that became really the trademark of the SSL compressor in the middle of the desk, where you would compress your whole mix. And uh, Cyclotonic, I believe, I've done a version called the Glue for about 90 euros or something, which is really, really good mm. as well, really worth checking. Uh, and it, like it, like, as its name 
its name implies, you know, the glue, it's really gluing everything together. Uh, let me show you, for example, here. Threshold, makeup gains, I'm gonna start on zero. So here, for example, if I got a fast attack, it's catching up all the, all the peaks. Personally, on this track, I probably would go with a slow attack. And I would go a ratio of four and a really fast release. Let's compare. Now you can bring more into it if you want. You're noticing how it's a bit looser? Yeah, yeah. And it's a lot tighter. Yeah. So how much tighter do you want it to be? It really depends, you know. I probably have gone a bit too much here. But, uh, I don't know, I think for this track it... It kind of it works, works, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, exactly, so... You hear the difference, mm -hmm. especially in the bottom end. Mm -hmm. Suddenly it's all really, really tight. So, yeah, um, you can try those. Uh, mm -hmm. other, I mean, there's loads. I mean, so Sonaxis, yeah. <coughs> I rate them. Uh, I really rate as well. For more creative stuff, that, that's the bread and butter for compression EQ. Creative toys for me is... Soft toys, I think they are. Echo Boys and all that series. Pff, amazing. Really, mm -hmm. really creative tools. Great delays and stuff like that. Um, I'm probably forgetting loads. You know, there, there are loads. Personally, because I've worked so much with hardware, I tend to, I have to say, I tend to be affected by the look of the interface. <laughs> and I know it's not right, yeah, but yeah, yeah. if I find the interface great to work with, it's part of, mm -hmm. you know, and that's one of the reasons I love using those emulation because I, I've used them for 15 years, like I said, so suddenly I'm back on natural ground, if you, don't, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. Oh, we've got a, a really good question from um, Wolf Pyroman who's asked um, about Waves tutorials. Um, to be honest, I'd recommend checking out the, the mastering course that we yeah. do, um, which JC developed actually. So yeah. that's definitely a good place to go if you've got, um, he says he's got like a, uh, the whole Waves bundle but just needs some explanation behind it. Um, that is definitely worth checking out. Just go to uh, the website pointblankonline.net and you'll find the, the mastering course, audio mastering course. Definitely yeah, want to we're going out. through the, the linear phase EQ, multi band comp, uh, going through all of the limiters, uh, the pre tech as well, which I've, I've showed you the pull tech, mm -hmm. because all of those are, are kind of quirky to use, you know. Yeah. Uh, okay, um, I've got another question about um, someone who's asked. Um, whether it's an absolute no-no to, to um, produce using headphones during the composition stage. No. I don't think at all. No, no, no I, I don't think, think um, at all, no. I mean, especially at the composition stage. I mean, it's, Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, I mean, again, it depends what kind of headphones you have, you know. I think uh, as long as you know them as well, if you're kind yeah, of, yeah. if you know their sound. Then you know, I've been getting more and more on headphones just because uh, I've got to be less noisy at home now. Yeah, I think my uh, neighbours don't really <laughs> like it as well. Uh, as so I've started to use headphones and I've bought those uh, Shenizer HD650. Mm -hmm. They're a bit pricey, about 280 quid. Uh, I think the Sennheiser HD range is, is a really good one to and check it's, out. You know, I'm getting used to it now and, I, and I'm checking my, the, uh, I'm doing a lot of mastering work on them. Uh, not on their own, you know, but uh, very much becoming more and more part of my setup. And, and if you're starting to, to know them well, I think it works really well. Okay, just a couple more questions. Um, someone, uh, Mark Me Up, has asked um, the Liquid Mix DSP. Um, he's yeah. seen it. Is it? Is it? Decent? It's relatively cheap. He said, "Is it a decent yeah. solution?" Yeah, it's a decent solution. It, they, they do some great stuff as well. And I, I like the idea of anything that can take a bit of DSP out of your computer is going to help. Which mm -hmm. is why I like the UAD, I suppose. It's because everything that happens on the UAD is actually uh, I'm using the CPU from the UAD, as you can see here but not from my from the computer mm -hmm. so it, it kind of really for a little bit of cpu so I, I'm, I'm all for that really okay um but the liquid mix yeah really good value i think good value for money cool um what else have we got here um someone who's asked um about reverb plugins if there's any recommendations you have for that again depending what you're going for personally i like the lexicon they've got that kind of sound which is on every Mm -hmm. Records, <laughs> so, so I quite like them. Again, the UAD's got a, a brilliant, the 224, the big, the big version of the Lexicon, really good. Uh, they've got also the plate, which my favorite plate in, uh, across all reverb. So I really like what UAD have done. I've got to say with mm -hmm. with reverb. Uh, Logic, 
Logic One is pretty decent. I think the space design is really space decent. Space designer is really good. It's good yeah. uh, again, the fact that it comes bundled, you know. A lot yeah. of people say it's not as good as the other one, which I now forget the name. There's another big convolution reverb, which is really, really big. Uh, maybe the name will come back, but uh, <laughs> it's not at the moment. But I've got to say, I think the space is an Akata pretty much. I'm not a big fan of the other ones, the digital reverb, the platinum and all that. Yeah, I mean, I'm not. I'm not. I'd rather use the lexicon for, for those. You mm -hmm. know. Okay. Um, what have we got here? Uh, Grins80 has asked, what's the best way to boost the RMS level of your sound and should it be done to each individual track? Okay, yeah. Well, I mean, we're to, yeah, I mean typically it's going to be done at the mastering, obviously, with the limiter. Uh, to boost the RMS, you know, you've got the, the peak level and the peak is what's stopping you boosting the IMS. It's because every time you're pushing the level, the peaks go in the red, so you've mm -hmm. got to stop the peaks. The best way to stop peaks is limiting at the mastering stage. But uh, I think it's a combination of doing it again in, throughout. Have you noticed here, for example, what we've done? If we're looking what we've done here, here on the bus, what I've done, all my drums are going into this bus. I'm going to switch off that for now. But all my drums are going into a bus, and what I've done here, and I'm doing a bit of gentle compression, on the whole bus of the drums. So the bus, a little bit, and then by doing that more, you notice the overall level is a bit more, first of all, I'm not going in the red anymore, so that means it's effectively louder. And I've done it here, I've done it here, I've done it here, so I've done it at several stages, and straight away you can get a bit more mm -hmm. RMS, basically, a bit more. And the ID, finally, on the master fader, and I should show you, I mean, there's several ways. We've got lots of different uh, plugins to do that. Classically, <coughs> the classic L2 here. So you would, you know, bring down the threshold a little bit. And that's your RMS. <laughs> you know, straight away it's a lot louder. Uh, so the L2 again, classic, I know a lot of people are discussing, you know, the, there are better limiters out there, and yes, but there is not one typical limiter that's going to be best for everything, so try lots of them. I think the L2 is a really good all round. Uh, I'm also a big fan of the UAD, so you're going to see it looks slightly differently. If I find it, precision limiter here, here it is, you've got, and the difference with that is you're sending how much you want to send in into the limiter, but the idea is the same. Effectively, that's how you're going to boost your, you know, your, your, your IMS. But I would be careful, don't put a limiter in every single channel to boost your IMS to the point where there's no more peak. You know, you end up with that kind of sausage with no peaks at all. Uh, and it doesn't sound quite natural to me. Okay, um, someone's asked, oh, this, is, this might be a good one for you, uh, tips on stereo imaging. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I mean, here, have you noticed on the drums, I've kept them quite mono, partly because a lot of clubs are still have mono That's system. Right, yeah. uh, and you want consistency across everywhere in the club. Even if a club has a stereo system, what you don't want is the, the punter in the club having a different experience, whether they are at the bar or yeah, at yeah, the other yeah. side of the dance floor, yeah. you know. So, um, but in terms of stereo, after that, it's really going to be on your synth. That's where the stereo, for me, I'm trying to keep my bass my drums quite mono, especially the big elements, kick, snare, claps. Hi-hat, you noticed here, I've started to make a middle of room. So I've put them more slightly on the side. And then it's really on the synth that you're going to do all the... It's really on the synth that you're going to be all doing the, the, the stereo imaging, you know. and. Uh, so here, for example, uh, to get some uh, more stereo spread, I would put reverb, maybe some delay, mm -hmm. maybe even some pitch shifting, some sort of modulation, phase of flanger, or pitch shifting slightly to start mm -hmm. making it wider. You've got the sample delay, which is uh, tricky because you can really put stuff out of phase, so you've got to be careful with that. But, uh, I mean, if people are really interested in imaging, what could 
maybe do a lesson and show that are different yeah, techniques. Yeah, I mean, maybe that's a good one for the future, really. I can do just a lesson um, on that, on different tricks to use, you know, for, for imaging, really. Okay, cool. Well, I think, um, to be honest, we're, we're kind of at the, the hour mark, really. Um, have you got anything else you want to go through? No, I'm happy with that. I'm unless there's I mean, what I would like in the future is really maybe uh, you guys start posting some questions. Yeah, definitely. Maybe even a project. I mean, ideally, I would like, you know, send, a pro send some projects. Yeah, that would be great. We pick one up yeah. and... And I can start going yeah. through some of the stuff that I feel could be that would give you a bit of an example of what we do with our DVRs, maybe. Yeah, you I mean, know, if, because if that's someone, the idea. Yeah, if if someone does want to um, send in a project or or send in your ideas for Friday Forum Live, then drop me an email. Um, you can reach me on Luke at pointblanklondon.com. I'll also post that um, on the, the kind of comments after the video has gone on YouTube. But yeah, maybe let's get some suggestions about future weeks, what you'd like to see us covering. Um, and in the meantime, um, while we wrap up, I just say, uh, again, courses do start Monday. So if you want to get more into this side of things, if you want to get the benefit of, of you know, DVR, someone like JC responding directly to, to your projects, your questions, you know, then do head over to the course page, pointblankonline.net, and you'll find the full range of courses starting on Monday. Um, also, do keep up to date with us um, via the YouTube channel, subscribe there, um, like the Facebook page, get involved on Twitter. Um, and yeah, if you do, do um, want to ask any questions about courses, then, then drop us a line. You can reach us on advice at pointblanklondon.com uh, point or advice at pointblankonline.net. Um, and yeah, that's about it from us. We'll be here, as always, next week, Friday at 1pm for the next edition um, of Friday Forum Live. Uh, so we'll see you then. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Thanks.